Good morning and uh, welcome everyone to our uh, webinar to celebrate the launch of, of, a, uh, of a remarkable book about a, a remarkable man, Rob Law, the uh, founder of the, uh, uh, the inventor of, uh, of Tronkey and uh, founder of, a, uh, uh, of what became a global brand. And um, he is uh, quite a remarkable man. And I want to tell you a bit of a story before we start about how I got to know Rob and how we embarked on this project. My agent uh, contacted me to ask me if I'd like to write a book about a man who was uh, famously rejected and humiliated on Dragon's Den. And he'd invented what uh, Trunky Ride on Suitcase. I said, well, it's interesting, but tell me a bit more. And uh, my agent said, well, I mean, I think his stories have quite a lot of depth to it, uh, she said, because not only is he uh, an incredible product designer and a very successful entrepreneur, he also has an amazing backstory where he's battled all his life uh, with cystic fibrosis. And not only has he had to overcome business challenges, he's also had to overcome um, incredible personal challenges, some of which we'll be going through this morning. And I said, now that sounds really interesting for me as a, both a psychologist and an entrepreneur, I thought this is just a fantastic story. I then spoke to Rob and met him and, and I can honestly say that he is one of the most impressive people I've ever had the, the privilege to meet. I think he's, he's what he has had to overcome. For any of us in business, we all have to overcome significant challenges uh, for what Rob has achieved, as you'll hear this morning. And, uh, and, uh, and if you buy the book, 65 Rose and a Trunky, you can read about it. Um, the challenges he's had to overcome really outweigh what most entrepreneurs have to overcome. And his story truly is an inspiration for us all, especially at this particular time now, when we're all reeling from the effect of, of, of the pandemic and obviously social unrest, and, uh, which is, is spreading um, from country to country. And, and, uh, and Rob's life really is a, is a lesson in, uh, in resilience, persistence, grit, and actually how to build an extraordinary business and create an extraordinary product against all odds, which is why the subtitle of the book is to find the odds in life and business. And, uh, and that's exactly what Rob's done. So uh, good morning, Rob, and, and welcome. And, and if you'd like to just quickly introduce yourself, and then we'll move on with the, the work. <coughs> Thanks for that kind introduction, Peter. Yes, it's been a, a new product that's being created uh, and uh, with a huge amount of care and love, but in a slightly different way than our normal trunkies and the rest of our products being created but uh, I'm really proud of uh, the book it's just launched online we got some hard advanced hard copies a week or two ago we both reread our book and uh, made sure uh, we're still happy with it and uh, I'm really pleased you're all here to celebrate its launch and to uh, listen to a bit more in depth about a couple of the stories to that um, and actually the format for this morning will go through um, talking to some of the pictures that are actually in the book uh, with a bit of background behind those two. So um, sit back and enjoy. Okay, that's great. Thanks very much, Rob. And we'll begin, I think, for um, certainly my knowledge, I didn't know Rob Law when I uh, um, uh, first got introduced to him, but I'd heard of Tronky. And I'd certainly remember the, the very famous the humiliation on Dragon Den, which we'll remind you all of now. Back in 2006, when businessman Richard Farley was part of the Dragon lineup, Rob came into the den asking for £100,000 for 10% of his company. Well, it's just over three years since I was in the den. It's not such a distant memory. I think Trixie the Pink Trunky still actually has nightmares about it. Meet Terence and Trixie, the world's first and only ride on suitcases for globe trotting tots. Toddlers can pack, sit on, and ride their trunkies while parents can keep their kids in tow, quite literally, the child sitting on the case. When you first came in, I actually thought it was quite cute. I loved it. I thought it was a really cute product. I could see how kids would enjoy riding on it. Bearing in mind you're putting small children on this, I mean, I saw you wheel it in a straight line. What happens mm -hmm. if it... Oh, OK. And then Theo got hold of it. The turning point in the den from a uh, good pitch to uh, things tumbling downhill out of my control was when Theo got a little bit too aggressive with my pink Trixie suitcase. I did not expect 
the strap to break so easily, I've got to be honest. <laughs> that got my attention. <laughs> what did you do there? It get my kids' attention as well. <laughs> Is this a fall to catch one? No, that's, you've pulled the, the hook off there, yeah? I shouldn't have done that, should I? So I think you've done really well. Congratulations to get this far, but I just don't think it's a business opportunity. Okay. You've got problems with the product. You've got problems what, that can be solved. Yeah, but you shouldn't come here with problems uh, uh, that can be solved without either identifying them or sorting them out first. And it, it drives me mad that we actually waste our time with these things. I too am out. Rob, hi. Um, this type of product is not patentable. No, it's not. And that's why I'm really concerned because within seven days, I could do a better job than that, make sure that the clips are working. I could have this in production by the end of next month. Your company is currently worthless. I'm out. I wouldn't buy okay. it. I wouldn't invest in the company. So I've no interest in this at all. So I'm going to declare myself out. But thank you very much indeed. But I just don't think it's a business opportunity. I just don't think it's a business opportunity. I just don't think it's a business opportunity. Yeah, well, uh, that's quite a, a, a remarkable piece of footage. And, and, uh, and I think there might have been uh, one or two glitches with the sound there, I think, as it was playing. So um, for those of you who did struggle to hear some of the sound, um, I, I can uh, suffice to say that, uh, that uh, the Dragons began by saying it was a cute product. And Deborah Meaden said she, she absolutely loved it. And suddenly, when Theo Pafitis broke the strap hook, they turned. Instead of being individual dragons looking at a business opportunity, they began functioning like a pack and ending in um, Deborah Meaden saying, um, there's no business opportunity here, um, with uh, Peter Jones saying it was absolutely worthless. Of course, Rob, you proved them all wrong, but going back to that experience of Dragon Den, what was it like and how did it feel as your pitch fell apart? Well, I've, I can actually see Trixie the Pink Trunky still cowering in the corner there. She won't watch these clips again. Uh, but actually, just to frame the context here, I, I'd come up with the idea nine years earlier. I'd been trying to get it to market. I had a, a failed licensing deal that had lasted three years, in which we'd sold the 20,000 units. And two weeks before filming, I'd quit my job as a product design consultant and gone full time on Trunky because 1,600 Trunkies arrived in Avonmouth Docks and I was able to start trading. Um, so going into the den, I was really excited, but quite nervous. Um, I knew I had a great product. I knew it should get a deal. Uh, and Richard Farley was my target because he had toddlers. And I joked with him that he still needed to use them despite doing family holidays with private jets. Uh, towed him round and uh, it was all going so well until, like you say, um, as we've all just seen and is now part of popular TV history, uh, Theo getting a bit too excited with Trixie and pulling off a strap hook. He seemed, um, he seemed genuinely angry, Rob. He seemed genuinely furious. I don't know if he was playing to the cameras, but when you watch that, he looks really annoyed. And when you say, rightly, this is a minor problem, it can be fixed. I mean, he really turns. Yeah, <clears throat> and, and that was the biggest challenge I had to deal with. I, I stood there. It's very surreal, actually. You walk up the stairs and it's just like the TV. I mean, you sat on your sofa in front of the dragons. And when you're up there pitching, you are literally just a foot further than sitting on your settee. You are there. Uh, so it's very surreal. And when he, um, when he pulled the strap hook off um, and there was this, this huge anger around it, I just couldn't, couldn't quite understand what the problem was. I mean, as a product designer and that the history of my story is all about problem solving, it was such a simple problem to solve, even if it was a problem, because I just towed Richard Farley around the studio, who's a, a fully grown man, but uh, he is, he's slightly shorter than me. Um, so uh, yeah, I really struggled to understand what the, the problem was. And every time I tried to talk to him about the solution, I was just thrown back. Uh, with all these crazy words that I just couldn't understand. Well, where do you think the crazy words came from? Brand. What do you think was driving that, Rob? Because you're right, it, it, Theo does seem at that point like a little bit crazed, you know, as if he's kind of lost his judgment. Yeah, well, I guess, I guess this is season three, so um, still the early days of Dragon's Den. Had huge viewership, nine million people watched this episode. Uh, but I think the dragons were becoming a bit wiser to the editing uh, on the TV. So. Um, when, when 
when they found something to jump on, they kind of jumped on it and formed, like you say, this pack mentality. I, in all fairness, I think we all lost a bit of our judgment. I really struggled to bring the topic back on uh, with the investment, uh, but all the other dragons saw the theatrics of, of Theo and just lambasted me with their, their well, I wouldn't say words of wisdom. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So when you left there, um, were you, did you think that's it? It's, it's finished, it's gonna be on the BBC, I'm gonna be ruined. I mean, how emotionally, what did you feel? Because you'd spent a long time building a business up, creating a product, and you felt you were on a threshold of significant growth and creating a significant brand. And here you get this assault by these dragons. How did you feel as you walked back down the stairs with nothing? Yeah, like as we said, it was, it was a nine year story to get to this point and um, not one to want to walk away completely empty handed. I managed to, when the camera stopped rolling, do a Dragon's Den discount with Richard and sold him two trunkies for £25. Uh, that's the price of Trunky back back in the day. Uh, so I, I did quite literally leave empty handed because he ended up posting me a check from Monaco, um, a Coots check nonetheless too. Uh, but yeah, I, I kind of walking down those stairs, I, I truly wish I'd invented a time machine, uh, not a ride on suitcase. Uh, and knew this was going to be a bit of a car crash telly at some point in the future. Um, so kind of, I guess that evening I started reflecting more on it and um, yeah, just started uh, castra uh, just started really worrying about the the future um, and started writing down things that I had going for me. I had a uh, a PO from the Museum of Modern Art, which was my first international customer in New York. Uh, I had several leads, um, and again, a bit of the backstory: uh, luggage manufacturers didn't want to take Trunky on; they thought it was a toy. Toy manufacturers didn't take Trunky on because they thought it was luggage, and exactly the same was for the retailers. So when I launched none of the high street and touch trunk eekers i kept playing by a ping pong uh to try and uh try and get it listed on their shelves but no one wanted to take the risk so it was a it was a fairly small business and um uh and it had only really been trading for two weeks okay so so you know you you obviously come come out of there and you did have an offer you know richard did make you an offer didn't he yeah so i was after 10 percent for uh uh 200,000 pounds, so a million pound valuation. And Richard seeing all the other dragons out, because he was, I mean, it was great. He was really interested, but he didn't feel like he was in a position, I was in a position to negotiate. So he took a very strong stance at 50% for 100 grand. So a 200,000 pound valuation. And that was just not something I could uh, afford you, to Were you at all given the assault you, you, that you, you just had on, on your, your idea, your business, your product? Did you feel at that moment vulnerable enough? Was a little bit of you tempted to say, yeah, okay, I'll take it? Or was it absolutely no way? Absolutely no, no, no way. No, I, I would have gone to 20%. Um, <clears throat> I, and yeah, my, my respect for Peter and, and Theo kind of had diminished. But in all fairness, Richard hadn't uh, lambasted me um, and he was my target. But it was just a, a deal structure that he wouldn't negotiate on. And I tried to convince him to reconsider his offer, but he just said no and um, there was no negotiation. For any business, for any entrepreneur considering selling you know, part of their equity, which is obviously what you were faced with there, um, how important do you think it is to have a line and stick to it regardless of circumstance? I think that's one of the, the clear ways you succeed is, is to, uh, being uh, clear on your dividing lines and um, sticking to them, uh, but always being open to opportunity and, and negotiation um but this was just far too big a leap um of an equity state to to accept okay well you obviously got a lot of determination and if we look at you as a as a as a small boy i think working i think the next picture is working with uh, i think you're helping your father and um and you've always one thing that struck me about you um, from the first time i met you you've got uh, 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 an incredible uh, determination and uh, and a real focus has that always been a part of your life and 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 did the cf did the cystic fibrosis play a, play a role in that getting you to focus on what you knew you could do yeah it's it's hard to pinpoint the exact time but i i always have known i've had cf and i've always known it's a limiting uh, it's going to put limits on my life so as a child when you dream of being an astronaut or a soldier that became quite apparent that was not a career option for me 
uh, despite uh, uh, living that dream through Lego. Um, and I just really enjoyed using my hands. Um, my dad's uh, uh, an interior retail interior designer, but this picture here, he was renovating a chapel in Wales and I was helping him out with Kate, uh, my twin sister, and, and just had great pleasure using my hands. At school, um, I've, I'm dyslexic, so I really struggle with the classical um, subjects, but uh, really felt uh, escapism, I guess, in, in creativity. So kind of, I think school careers day when I was uh, a, a, an early teenager, I was told I'd be a landscape gardener. That didn't quite tick all my boxes, uh, but I really enjoyed art and graphic design at school. And there was this, new subject I discovered on my own called product design. I say new, it was, it's still in its less popular uh, understanding. This is before Jonathan Ives made it incredibly cool to do uh, of Apple fame. But um, yeah, I kind of uh, tried to find everything I could about this industrial design, design stroke product design, bought books and, and came across one book about um, uh, in the design industry, they're very well known, Richard Seymour and Dick Powell, who did a book about how to do yeah. photorealistic renderings using markers and, and that just captured my uh, attention I just thought that was the best thing ever and, and learned that skill set of how to create products um, look photorealistic uh, and did all I could so when I was 14 I did a work placement as a product design um, at a product design agency and I, and I was sold and that then was me finding as we talk about in the book my element thanks to Sir Ken Robinson but unknown to myself back then uh, and I did everything I could to focus on becoming a product designer. Finding your element, you know, it, it's interesting because I want to take a step back to something you said, which again, something that struck me when I met you. Not only were you battling with city fibrosis, you were also dyslexic. And Malcolm Gladwell has made the point, among others, that there's a disproportionate number of, of successful entrepreneurs who actually suffer from, from dyslexia. And that marginalised you at school, and you, I believe, were what was known in your school as a burden baby. Um, do you want to say a few words about that particular struggle you had to fight at school? Yeah, so in high school there was a, uh, what was called a special needs class where all the, the, the uh, thickos, as, as, as probably would uh, be known by the other students, um, uh, went and spent a couple of hours a week in this class run by Mrs Burden and we were known as Burden's Babies. Uh, so yeah, it was, um, that was a, a, a kind of a a tag I really didn't like at all and I knew I I was going to be good at something uh, and I felt it was completely unfair to be branded um, uh, thick. So there's, did, did anything, the link with dragon, when the dragons were attacking you in the den, did it at all trigger any memories of, um, of um, you being in school, being stigmatised as a burden, burden baby, and being perhaps name called or or picked on a little bit because of it, or, or was there no you blanked it off completely? Not not in the den, but on on reflection that evening, it kind of came back to me a bit, and um, I think it was the it, 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 it was the their pack mentality and them almost uh, bullying me that kind of brought back some deep memories of school. Uh, and I appreciate how, how, how difficult that must have been. But if we look at the early drawings of the, of the Trunky, moving on to how you developed the Trunky, you obviously had this incredible aptitude for design. You could see design. I know other products you designed, like you designed a recumbent bike as a teenager, you designed furniture. You had this incredible aptitude for design, which, which for me, with no aptitude at all in that area, is, is almost like, a, uh, it's like a, a, a miraculous gift, you know, and, and, and you really knew what you were good at and you, you seem to have a natural flair for it. And, and this, I understand, is the early design for the, for, the, um, for the Trunky when it was called Rodeo. When did you first come up with the idea for the Trunky? So uh, let me take you back to 1997. I was a second year design student at Northumbria University. And uh, we were asked to enter a national luggage design competition that was sponsored by a large plastics manufacturer. So um, I went along to uh, the local department store up in Newcastle, Fenix in Eldon Square, looking for inspiration, trying to do a bit of research. And I remember browsing the luggage section and uh, hard molded suitcases were quite fashionable all the way back then. So the likes of Carlton and Sam's Knight uh, with injection molded plastic suitcases. Uh, but it was all black and boring and kind of I lost a bit of uh, inspiration in that department and, and kind of drifted into the kids toy section. 
I mean, maybe it's because I'm a big kid at heart, but I remember looking at all the bright colours of the kids' toys and pausing by the ride-on toys and reminiscing about my brother who used to ride his ride-on tractor relentlessly around the garden. Uh, and the manufacturing technique used for making ride-on toys is uh, wastes a lot of the space inside. And I thought, well, why not use that technology that is really fashionable in adult luggage and make a really functional ride-on toy that's primary function is luggage. So maximise that internal capacity, make it fun and characterful for kids to ride on. And um, that might be a nice idea. And then you, and then it, if you look on the next slide here, you, uh, you uh, won a competition. Yeah, so a year later and a lot more hard work, I uh, pitched my rodeo design at the, the competition and uh, Alan Griffiths there, a very kind gentleman, uh, awarded me the, uh, the prize and uh, I won my first design, well, yeah, my first design competition. And um, uh, th I'm 19 years old here. Um, with a full head of hair, look at that. <laughs> That's very impressive, yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, was um, was really taken back by some of the words they said to me, kind of, they said, you know what, Rob, you've got quite a commercial idea here, you should try and license it to a, a manufacturer. And they had links with Carlton, uh, and I thought, great, I could try and get this made, manufactured in production, be really uh, ahead of the curve with my design peers, getting something into the market and uh, hopefully I'll get some royalty checks from it and that will make me a very happy boy. Um, so I went to approach Carlton and pitch them my rodeo ride on suitcase concept and they very politely told me I'd invented a toy and I should go and see a toy manufacturer. So I did some research, went to see a couple of toy manufacturers uh, and they very politely told me I'd invented a piece of luggage. In fact, one of the negotiations with the toy manufacturer went on for 21 months before they told me, actually, we think this is luggage. So yeah, it was really hard to try and get the product into market in the first place. Well, you, you know, you, you obviously overcame that. We'll see how you did that later, but also you had, had many other, um, you know, battles in your life. You've battled um, cystic fibrosis all your life. And we'll see in the next slide here that you were, uh, uh, one of uh, one of two, one of twins. As your you and your uh, twin sister Kate. How old are you there? About probably about six months. Uh, we've been uh, yeah kept in hospital for four months. We were a month premature, and after three months, we were diagnosed with cystic fibrosis. Uh, and this is mum uh, back home with us. And long. then uh, on the next slide, I think you're in. This is your first day of school, isn't it? Yeah, uh, first day of school. And, uh, I knew it was going to be a. Uh, a bit more uh, challenging uh, progressing through school than I did back then. And, and obviously the story um, doesn't end well because in, your, in, your, um, in the book you, you have a wonderful drawing I think that you did. I will just hold it up here so, so people can see. And the dedication, uh, this is a drawing you did of your sister Kate, is to, is to your sister Kate and I, I read it. For Kate, your bravery still inspires me today. And, and sadly, after a, what everyone hoped was a successful heart and lung transplant or a lung transplant I think she she died at the age of of um, 16. Uh, what impact did her death have on your life? Well it had a, a huge impact on not just me but our family it was um, hugely tragic and devastating uh, and I guess faced with a potential similar fate um, I kind of being a problem solver thought well I could spend my time worrying about the future um, or I could um, make the most of my life so I decided to not worry about how what CF was going to do to me in the long term not to think too far into the future and just spend all my energy on them um, following my passion around creativity where I could escape uh, and um, not dwell too much on the future but actually it was my mum's grief that was the stark reminder to the pain that the family was going through. So I decided to make her a promise yeah. that she wouldn't, she wouldn't lose her, another child. Yeah, and that's where we open the book, isn't it? And the book, the book opens with, with Rob um, making, making this promise and saying that, that uh, your mother wasn't going to live through this twice, that you were going to live and you were going to, make a success of your life and uh, which of course you did and and i think this this is for me is what makes your story not only very human um but it also makes it really a standout story among all stories of successful entrepreneurs really it truly is remarkable and, and credit to you really for for having to 
the courage really to uh, to 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 battle to battle through it and and uh, and yet you did you know you went on from this you 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 made your decision you were going to focus on what you could control you were going to focus on problems you could solve you're going to live for the moment live day by day and from that moment you went on i would say to invent uh, invent trunky to build a business and as we'll see from the from the next slide here um quite a success you made of it you know and there's uh, i think there's the the team of what do you call it was this the mothership or yeah this is the mothership down in uh, bristol um and the office this is taken a couple of years ago when we were having a summer party and we got a local graffiti artist down to to paint the side of the building and we all tagged it so uh, there's lots of tags there behind me on that green sphere so yeah kind of we're on a mission to take trunky to other galaxies yeah. and how have you how have you coped running a business building a business really while, while battling cystic fibrosis I've well, been a, it's been quite a struggle I, i've really struggled in the early days certainly in startup i just had so much determination to dedication to try and make a success of the brand that my health took a back seat um and i'd often spend uh, several months kind of running at 110 miles an hour and then get burnt out have to go into hospital um get some um, intravenous drug treatment and then get back on the, 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 the treadmill and, uh, and, and go at it again. Um, in the early days, flying all over the world to China, New York, Europe, um, that took quite a toll on me because I'm outside of my usual re routine, which uh, is always a bit of a struggle when you're traveling. Would you have uh, a routine? Of I'm, I'm, I'm one of the less affected people with CF and I've managed to get away with an awful lot. But actually one of the key things that's been a, an essential part of my survival is exercise. Um, and I'm we'll see that in the next slide. I think you're holding uh, one of your children, and there we go. What have you? What's been? What's been going on there? Yes, yeah, so this was a, a triathlon I entered um, uh, when Ida was quite young, and uh, yeah, she is with a support T-shirt. But I've always run, I've always swam, um, and I've always cycled. So I kind of put them all together and started doing triathlons. But actually, in the early days, to get me to to, to keep my health, uh, to keep me fit and healthy, I always had a goal each year to to do something so one year it was a start running mar half marathons then it was well, let's do three half marathons in a month then it was do a marathon then it was ride from Land's End to John O'Groats and then I, I got the triathlon bug and um, started doing sprint Olympic and then half Ironman distance events and that that's really been my my main focus for uh, staying healthy and also staying mentally fit and um, I find when I'm out running I never listen to music I just let my mind uh, unfold and, and solve whatever problems I've had that day or try and uh, understand uh, the situations I'm going through and just um, use it as a, a therapeutic process as well as um, so, so, so it's remarkable so so you're so you have um, dyslexia and you managed to find yourself a, a real design a real skill in product design and get into university and create a world-leading product you're you're humiliated on dragon's den you overcome that you have lungs that simply do not work like ordinary people's lungs work where you have to have a daily regime of, of drug treatment and and, and 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 physiotherapy and yet you still manage to run uh you know half marathons ironmans triathlons which which most people with perfectly normal lungs would struggle to do that's that's quite an achievement. You've overcome a lot of obstacles, huh? Well, I find um, it's quite interesting, and we've discussed it ourselves, haven't we, where uh, the, the mental strength we all have, I think, can still surprise you. And I still surprise myself when I'm uh, however many miles into a, to an event that I can still, despite my body's uh, limits, I can still psychologically keep myself pushing, pushing harder and harder. And, and for me, it's pushing against CF that's my driving force and it, and, it, and it helps me achieve some quite remarkable things. So when you're running, in a way, mentally, you're saying you're giving the finger, if you want, to uh, city fibrosis. Yeah, saying, absolutely. You're not, you're, I'm going to win. Yeah, you won't, you won't defeat me. You won't defeat me. And as we'll see from the next slide, I think the extent of your success is, uh, has been actually acknowledged by the Queen. Um, you went and got an MBE. Uh, what was the MBE for and what did she say to you? It was for services to business and um, there's a great um, backstory to this, but I won't go into it now. It's in the book about how I received the news for uh, getting the MBE. Um, but I, when I did, did receive the news, I kind of didn't really feel I deserved it, uh, but did think it'd be a nice day out for the family. So I accepted 
and um, a couple of months later we went to visit the Queen at Windsor Castle, uh, kind of ushered in, uh, very uh, proper people speaking very poshly, um, lots of pomp and circumstance, uh, you must do things in a certain way, so yeah I was ushered through and uh, eventually in this big grand hall, um, uh, uh, it was my turn to walk up and, and have a quick chat with the Queen just as I walked up as everyone who had gone up previously someone whispers in the Queen's ear gives her a quick briefing and she presents me with this uh, this medal and um, she said no well you make these little suitcases I w won't do the accent uh, <laughs> and uh, we had a brief dialogue about uh, what trunkies were and yeah. Um, yeah. Very good. And, 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 and I think that you say you didn't deserve it. I mean, I think pretty much everybody who knows your story and, and everybody, I think, who's listening to this webinar this morning will think, how could you believe you don't deserve it when you've achieved what you've achieved? I guess living it, you kind of don't feel, any, well, you don't really feel any different. I think part of the psychology of my survival is just to uh, believe I'm normal uh, and I, I keep my CF behind a wall. Uh, I believe I'm just as normal as anyone else. And yes, I have to take drugs and do physio every day. Um, but that is my life. I've done it my entire life. And um, that is normal to me. And, and, and not only did you uh, get the MB from there, you didn't miss the opportunity of being in, was it Windsor Castle or Buckingham Palace? Where were you? Win Windsor Castle, yeah. Windsor Castle, so, you uh, didn't miss the opportunity, as we'll see from the next slide, to uh, do some, uh, some good, uh, good guerrilla marketing. Yeah, so I thought there'd be a, an opportunity to get a good, good photo. Um, and uh, Tipu, the tiger trunk, he volunteered to, to wear a fur coat uh, and look like a corgi. So um, we took him along to Windsor Castle. I kind of bottled the opportunity to present it to the Queen because I thought I might get shot. Uh, but uh, a bit later on, we were walking around the gardens and I saw in the distance the Queen's dog walker and couldn't believe my luck. So I ran up and... Uh, yeah, we had a brief chat and uh, got some great photos of uh, uh, the trunky corgi meat and a real Queen's corgi. And, and again, from, from the next slide, you also, I think, did uh, a similar feat in, uh, was this Longleat? Yeah, so everyone believes this is photoshopped, but if you watch the YouTube video, you know it's not. Um, yeah, launching a tiger trunky and we've always marketed on a shoestring, so it's always trying to think creatively about how we can get... Um, a bit of buzz around around the brand and something that ties in with our brand values. So we thought, well, why not go and um, meet a real tiger with the launch of our, our tiger and Longleat Safari Park uh, uh, helped us get get this get this shot. And actually, the, the keepers said, oh, we should put some meat in there so that this tiger and this tiger is only three years old, called Sandori, um, uh, and she she performed magnificently. And we got this uh, amazing shot, and she ended up licking. The black stripes off the tipu trunky with her very rough tongue in the long grass after the shot. What what does this tell? What advice would you give people? Because obviously marketing and branding has been a, a key part really of the the, the the trunky story. I mean, how have you approached marketing and branding the product? How did you build a global brand? We've never really had much of a marketing budget, so it's always been um, initially through PR. I kind of knew I had a brightly coloured product, had some great photography. And it was quite quirky, so hopefully the press would pick up on it. So we invested all my available cash in PR in the early days, and we featured in uh, a gazillion magazines and publications. <clears throat> and then it's having a bit of fun with the product uh, and looking for kind of PR stunts, as we've seen there and probably see next, um, to try and get the word out. Um, but I think fundamentally, most of the marketing comes from word of mouth, and that's that's. Trunkies being seen in the airport, being great adverts of kids really in, enjoying their ride through the airport, uh, despite some business travellers maybe getting the odd bruised ankle. Um, but yeah, creating a great product that people really love. Um, and we've got two customers we've got to hit. So the parent and the child. So the parent really looks for utility and function and value, yet the child needs to see personality, something they can fall in love with. And hitting those two core things has been probably the, the cornerstone of our marketing strategy because now in today's age social media people talk about products they review products and we've had over 10,000 reviews across all the Amazon platforms around the world that average about 4.7 stars so that's um, a pretty good kudos for, for our brand. And you've won I understand you've won I think you've won about 100 more than 120 business awards including as we'll see next um, some recognition from Richard Branson. 
Yeah, so this was the Sunday Times fast track. We got to uh, number 42 in the Sunday Times fastest growing uh, British businesses, uh, which was a nice accolade, but even nicer to get invited to Richard Garden's house for a garden party with the other 100 um, shortlisted companies. And uh, again, kind of taking a leaf out of Richard's book, I wanted to leverage a bit of a PR opportunity. So I got the team to create a Virgin Galactic Trunky that I was going to present to him. I made two because I'm a big fan of space travel. So one's on my desk, he's got the other. And uh, I, I decided not to lose, uh, lose the opportunity to present it to him this time like I did with the Queen. And uh, we got this great photo. And, and, and one of the challenges, one of the key challenges really you had as a business, and I think a lot of businesses will have, especially in the current climate, who, who are involved in, say, manufacturing or who have complex supply chains, is where they manufacture. And one of the decisions you made was, I think at the time of the 2012 Olympics, was um, to take control of your supply chain, if you want, because a lot, a lot of manufacturing was happening out in, 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 in Asia. And uh, you took on a factory in the UK. How did it go and what did you learn from that? You can see the picture on the next slide. Yeah, well, we, um, there, there are multiple reasons for reshoring and we go into them in the book. But essentially, uh, I really wanted control of my supply chain. Uh, the exchange rate fluctuations, we, at one point in 2009, sterling devalued by 20% against the US dollar. So that meant our products were 25% more expensive. Uh, and it's quite a large bulky product to ship. So shipping can account to about 20% of our landed cost. So uh, there are multiple reasons, but I decided to uh, reshore production back to the UK with a, a third party manufacturer. Uh, and uh, we pulled it off in 2012. My PR vision was to have trunky ro trunkies rolling off the production line with Union Jacks on. So I thought the best Union Jack to put on the trunky now is the LOCOG London Olympic license. So we did that. And it, and it was fantastic. We had all the national TV stations down filming and really rode the rise, the wave of reshoring. So everything was going really well in 2012 to the end of the year when I got a call from the factory owner uh, to go for a meeting in London. And he told me he was just about to go into administration and would I be interested in buying, rescuing the business. Uh, so as a, as a product designer, I understand manufacturing. I kind of really passionate about British manufacturing. I thought it was a great opportunity to get more companies manufacturing in the UK and owning a factory uh, would be a great platform for that. So it was a very simple decision. Uh, little did I know it was going to be fraught with a huge amount of risk. So um, you know, it was difficult. I, obviously, it was a difficult journey, but but eventually I think you got the factory right. Yeah, it took, uh, took several years and a couple of million quid, but we turned the factory around and uh, it's a hugely proud achievement uh, in my business journey, uh, but also great for the brand. So now with our, most, a lot of our sales are now done online through e-commerce. So it's manufactured in Plymouth and it ships straight to mum in the UK, France, Germany, or even the US. Uh, so we've got a really tight supply chain. It kind of talks to our green values, uh, reducing our carbon footprint. Uh, uh, and there's a whole host of other benefits around being able to make our what we call made for me so you can customize the trunky a child and their parent online and get uh, one of a billion different color com combinations delivered within five working days uh, it's been a given us so many benefits but it, it cost us very dearly in the early days to get it right and it was all about people as business always is it's all about people and inheriting uh, a previous owner um, and managing director who um, was not aligned with our vision, future vision of the factory. Uh, we had to get rid of him and that took a while. And then trying to find the right talent on the factory floor, trying to recruit new talent. And that proved quite challenging because so much of that talent doesn't exist in the UK anymore because of the mass move in the eighties to China for production. So we really struggled to find the right people and point the, the factory in the right direction. But one of the key things uh, that I did as soon as I walked through the door was this, co this company needs purpose because at night the night shift would just produce scrap no one cared no one had a job description no one had an appraisal it was kind of like a, a factory of headless chickens uh, with a lot of talent there it's just it hadn't been directed or, or hadn't had been given the responsibility to take ownership so we put a banner up on the front of the factory saying proud to be manufacturing in the UK really got the spirits lifted of the team because not only were their jobs saved, but we made it really clear why why they should get out of bed and come to work. And that was actually through a workshop we, we did with them to understand what they're passionate about. Uh, and we pinned it above the door and that was kind of the, the start of a long journey to turn the factory around.
from keeping your team motivated. And get, it struck me how motivated the people who work for you are, and how motivated they are by, uh, by the Trunky brand. And, and that's been fundamental to your success. Yeah, it's kind of uh, uh, really understanding uh, what the purpose of the business is. I'm, I'm a big believer in purpose, and that's what drives us. So getting the right people on board uh, the business, they've got to be clear what our purpose is, and that's uh, we don't make plastic luggage. We make products that allow parents and carers to take their kids off exploring the world. We've moved from not just holiday, but to everyday adventures with, our, with the rest of our range. So... Um, yeah, we, we have a clear vision of what the business is about and everyone who comes to work with us or we work with get that uh, and most importantly, so do our customers. I think also what, what strikes me about Trunky, something very, uh, very early on, was, uh, was how really it creates really memorable experiences for children and their families. You know, I mean, people are very passionate about the Trunky brand. Parents who've had children who've had Trunkies can look back on all the great fun they had on all, all the... The, 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 the wonderful things that Trunky brought into, into their holidays or into their family life. And kids have fantastic memories of being pulled along airports and, and on, on Trunkies. And I think it's very much what we call a passion brand, isn't it? People buy into it emotionally. Yeah, we, we like to think so. Uh, I mean, I, uh, the, the financial community always want to look at EBITDA and I just want to show them pi the pictures I've got of kids having Trunkies as birthday cakes. <laughs> Yeah, I'm with you on that one. And, and OK, but it's not, again, another challenge you then faced, perhaps one of the biggest of your commercial career, was um, when uh, Trunkies were copied. And, uh, and you tried to protect Trunky and ultimately you lost. There's a question come in here and we'll see on the next slide. You're holding a, a, a judgment, I think, uh, from the court. But we'll see on the next slide. Uh, a question comes in. What was your feeling? when seven law lords at the Supreme Court made a judgment against you, when it was patently clear to everyone that your original trunkies and the copies uh, were, the, were, were, were the same as the copies which were littered around the courtroom. Did you feel the law had failed you? Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll answer the question and we'll take a step back and just give a bit of a background to the story. But. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'd taken it all the way to the Supreme Court to, to revise the hearing of um, originally we won in court at High Court. That was appealed. We lost. We took it to the Supreme Court. We lost. But um, despite um, being really devastated by that news, there wasn't anything else I could do. You know, I'd taken it as far as I could. I'd had a good run with the media and PR, which we'll talk about in a sec, um, but I lost and I had to, I could spend my, folk, my time and energy wallowing in self-pity that we lost, or I could just get on with carrying on with the global brand and business building. So uh, it was deeply upsetting, but uh, I had to move on and I had to move on quickly, otherwise it would just drain my, my energy. T taking a step back, as, as Peter said in, uh, in that first clip, Trunkies aren't patentable. You cannot patent the idea of a ride-on suitcase. You can patent the way the catches work, and we've got patents on those, or the way you fix wheels. So my protection for the Trunky was just around design, which is protecting the shape of the product. Uh, and we felt this product here, which was from a, a British um, company, uh, that was too close to the design uh, of my product. So we took it to the High Court, we got a European injunction, we banned them from selling the product until the hearing. And this was the judgment from the High Court that ruled in our favour and said they should not be selling this product. They then appealed um, on some technicalities uh, and the, the appeal judge um, overruled that original decision. Uh, and we were then faced with um, paying the other sides all their legal fees, paying um, paying them money for the lost sales of having that injunction. And that just felt completely wrong. Uh, um, we did a, a PR campaign getting celebrity designers like um, Sir Terence Conran, Kevin MacLeod, Paul Smith to back us uh, and raise a lot of profile in the press and media um, to, to try and get this heard at the Supreme Court. And on our, on our big day in the Supreme Court, we had the Intellectual Property Office standing up on our side telling the judges that the ramifications of their decision were so great they should defer this to Europe. Uh, and this was about a year before Brexit kicked off. So uh, that was probably in hindsight a red, red flag to a bunch of bulls. Uh, but uh, yeah, we, we ended up losing. Um, but we did, we did kind of win because the day after the judgment was handed out with our defeat, 
every single national newspaper ran uh, beautiful full page pictures of trunkies entertaining kids around the world with the headline about our, our court loss but we managed to spin it uh, uh, more about yeah we might have lost and it might have cost us a lot of money but actually this has big ramifications to the design community so like you've done and get a conversation going about about uh, the future of design registration and so like you've done in every other aspect of your life you turned a defeat what, what other people would see as a defeat or a disadvantage you turned it to your advantage ultimately yeah, it was a similar experience to that of Dragon's Den, which we didn't actually touch on. But when the episode aired of Dragon's Den six months later, the BBC advertised the episode as wheelie rubbish. Uh, and I knew I was going to be facing some serious uh, car crash telly and probably the ruining of my business. But I thought, well, <clears throat> I'll take the opportunity. I'm bound to get some web traffic. I'll just post a survey up online just to get people's feedback. And... Um, amazingly that night over 2,000 people filled in the survey with phenomenal words of support and we actually sold out and it, it very quickly became apparent that the public saw straight through the theatrics they got the product or all, all, all that nine-year journey up, up, up until that point I, was tr I knew parents would get it uh, but my challenge was trying to find manufacturers to make it retailers to sell it or even investors to back it uh, but all that middle ground oh, just just disappeared and the, the proof was in the pudding Consumers get it, they love it, uh, and that was the making of us. Well, consumers get it, they love it. You've overcome this adversity. Did Theo, he came to see you some years later, as we'll see in the next slide, and uh, did he ever apologise? Did he ever say, sorry, Rob, I got it wrong? He couldn't quite come to apologise, but he said I had done well in a slightly patronising way. way. But this picture here, yeah, I'm presenting him with a Herculean trunky, which had padlocks instead of strap hooks. Uh, and he, he was a nice, personable guy. Um, but yeah, he couldn't admit he was wrong. Yeah, no, I suppose that that's, uh, goes against the Dragon's brand, doesn't it? But, but several years later, I, I went to uh, the Growing Business Awards to pick up Small Business of the Year. Um, uh, uh, and going up on stage, um, Theo had just announced the previous award and was coming off the stage and I was going up to collect mine. So I was able to give him a little wink. <laughs> Very good. And what, how did he respond? Did he give you a smile? Well, we were like passing in the night, but I didn't yeah. look behind me. Uh, <laughs> But I, yeah, I mean, the dragons are clearly aware of the, uh, the success of Trunky. I think, didn't uh, Duncan Bannatyne say it's the one they missed? He says, I think he famously said, oh, we, I see it all the time in airports. He said, that's yeah. one we missed. Am I right in saying that? Yeah, he said that on uh, Celebrity, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? Yeah. Okay, very good. So, okay, we now come, just to wind up before we go to a couple of questions have come in from, a few questions have come in from, from the audience today. Um, you were told you'd never have children. Ever. Uh, this is another uh, obstacle put in, in uh, put before you, and yet, as we'll see in the next picture here, you have uh, three beautiful children. Um, is that are they your greatest achievement? Yeah, they are. I, I, I kind of, yeah. Again, being a big kid at heart, I love children. Love spending time with them, their spontaneity, and just being lost in their their kind of imagination. Um, but I kind of. We, we talk about the story in the book, I won't ruin in that, but I, I discovered in my early 20s I couldn't be a father uh, due to complications with cystic fibrosis. But kind of not trying to wallow in the unknown, I just shut that off, put that behind a wall, just focused on life. I didn't need to have children in my early 20s and it was only uh, through um, talking with my business coach a couple of years into the business when she asked me, what, what's it all for? Why, why do you want to be successful um, in business? And um, it eventually dawned, dawned on, on me that I wanted to have children. And um, I didn't know how to, but fortunately my partner had, had been doing some research and she wanted to have some kids too. And she uh, believed it may be possible. So we went along to a GP and discovered that um, medical advances over the last 30 odd years had come on leaps and bounds and, and it was now possible to have children. And... Uh... And your proudest moment, I think you, you, you describe as, as pulling your daughter um, along Edinburgh Airport on a trunky. Yeah, so I mean, there, there, there were quite a few challenges with the IVF treatment and uh, we kind of run that along trying to fight the legal battle in uh, the factory. But yeah, it wasn't, wasn't easy. It was a very uh, tough experience to go through. But eventually we were successful. And um, yeah, I, I guess the first time my daughter Ida used her trunky pr 
properly in an airport, going through Edinburgh Airport. It was actually off to my brother's wedding, and I was towing her. She was about 18 months, uh, and just really enjoying uh, being towed along uh, with a daughter I wasn't supposed to have. The product I was told I was worthless um, in uh, rapidly approaching my 40s, which wasn't a, a life expectancy that my parents thought I'd be able to achieve. And, and really, it's, I guess, in the book, uh, I think we describe it as the, as the journey that, Rob, uh, you were not supposed to make. This mm -hmm. was the journey you were not supposed to make. And, and I think you summarise it there really, really beautifully, really. All the adversity and obstacles you've had to overcome to build, not just a successful business, but, but a great family and, uh, and, and really to, to, to build a successful life. And, and the subtitle of the book is to find the odds in life and business. And, and, uh, and you've done e e exactly that. And, and, um, and, and one question has come in um, about the title of the book. Why did we call it 65 Roses and a Trunky? So children uh, often refer to cystic fibrosis, many of the, the kids who suffer from it, uh, as 65 roses because they struggle with the pronunciation. Um, <clears throat> and there's a bit of a backstory that's the prelude to the book um, about where that kind of came from. Uh, so that's, that's the title of the book. And we, we loved the title, didn't we, Peter? And yeah. it was quite late on, but it was a bit of a, it's an intriguing title, but it, people just don't know the backstory. So you have to pick the book up to find out why we've called it that. So hopefully yeah. it works. Hopefully it works. Yeah, and, and in the preface, we, we talk about the story of the, the mother who, who, uh, who, who did have a, a child with cystic fibrosis and was trying to conceal it from him. And, she, uh, and he heard her on the phone saying cystic fibrosis. And, but, and when his mum came back in, she said, uh, Mummy, mummy, I, I know what I've got now. And she was horrified and said, well, what have you got? He said, I've got 65 roses. And, uh, and it's just a, a, wonderful, a, a wonderful story. And, and, uh, um, and, and a couple of, of um, uh, more questions that have really come in. If we go into the, if we go into the Q and A here, um, because I think you can see the book there. Oh, there's the book. I think if we, if we go back to one slide, I think, is that the book, uh, is that the book arriving? Yeah, that's the book arriving the other week. Uh, a couple of boxes of books and the Trunkies uh, had a bit of a stampede to, um, to see if they got their, their own design in the, in the book. And actually, we, the inside cover of the book, we've managed to get every Trunkie ever designed on, <clears throat> on the inside. What's called wallpapers, I learnt, uh, of the book. <laughs> that's very good. So, um, so going to, can we just end up with a, just a, a three or four questions, really, for us to to finish up on and, and and these are all questions that have come in and uh, one is how has success changed you if at all um and imagine you're at your funeral what would you like said about you i i think in the early days success might have got a bit ahead of me and um uh, uh and you kind of start dreaming of a, a long road paved to gold um but then you're starkly reminded that that's not easy to achieve with uh, quite a few of the hurdles i've had to overcome uh, uh, and I think success is just a hiatus in the a series of defeats as we say in the book um, and and it's over the years now I've kind of learned to ground myself to appreciate uh, and have gratitude for those wins but uh, not to get carried away uh, uh, and know that there's going to be another challenge just around the corner but so that, that, that's for business but but my success really on my personal reflection is is kind of where I am now with a, a great family, with some time to have spent writing this book and to explore other opportunities uh, and, um, and for the business to be in great hands with my management team running the day to day and freeing me up to, to, to do other projects. And that leads on really to another question that's come in that says, to what degree do you say that you were responsible for creating the, the uh, significant events really in your commercial life and, and what role did circumstance or chance play? Well, I think chance and luck play a I mean, uh, when I launched Trunky in 2006, um, the low cost airlines were flying a lot of people over to Spain and the like. So uh, that was certainly a bit of luck there. Uh, I, th I think there's, it's an entrepreneur's job to see an opportunity, um, to see some, some luck and then to focus down double down on that and try and make it really work for you. So um, yeah, you get, you get the hook, um, which is quite often luck. And then um, it's what you then do with your time to make the most of that opportunity. And we've got a question coming here from Annie, our editor at Wiley, uh, Rob, which is, uh, 
which is a great question she's asked. She says, when we first signed the book contract last year, Rob, how did you feel? Many of our authors are incredibly overwhelmed at that point. Did you feel that, that or, or feel overwhelmed or were you determined to tackle the challenge in the same way as you've tackled everything else? Well, it's kind of uh, just like the trunky again. We, um, we pitched the book to all the main publishers um, and they turned it down. They said uh, I wasn't famous, famous enough to write a personal memoir and the way we um, I had structured the book and the story I wanted to tell wasn't a business how-to. So we got a knock back by all the major publishing houses. So when uh, Annie approached me out of the blue on LinkedIn looking to do an entrepreneur book, um, we I jumped at the chance and uh, so did they. And they, we very quickly came to an agreement to, to do a publishing deal. Um, so how did I feel? Um, I, was, I was excited, but I was also a bit nervous because the... Um, the backstory of the book, my dealing with CF, it has been quite a private matter for me up until this point, and I've never really wanted anyone's pity. Uh, um, and I wanted, uh, I thought it was about the, about time to, to really tell the full story if it can inspire other people. Well, and, and it's interesting, and, and, and again, looking at, uh, at this, some questions come in, you, you feed on challenges. What's the next one? What's the next challenge? Yeah. Well, we're currently going through COVID and uh, luggage is not the most popular uh, category of consumer product at the moment. But fortunately, the trunkies are very useful for staycations and camping trips and going off to see grandma, hopefully in a week or two's time. Uh, so, yeah, we're just doubling down, getting through this, uh, this epidemic, uh, but also our wider portfolio of products as some of them are doing really well, like our children's toddler reins that are very beneficial for social distancing. We're having some record sales there. So we're, yeah, we're trying to get through the, the current challenge. Uh, but I always believe on the, if we get through to the other side, there'll be opportunities, if not already now. So um, it's just riding that storm. And I think resilience comes down to, for me, an understanding that whatever the challenge, it's gonna be a finite time, hopefully short lived, but you will get through it. Uh, and you've just got to really focus your energy uh, to overcome these challenges is hugely draining. So there's no point in worrying about the things you can't solve. You've got to focus on what you can influence and what you can do. So I can't uh, influence when the, the lockdown is going to be released, um, but I can influence my costs. I can influence my marketing message and I can influence where we export to. So it's really using, uh, using our energies wisely uh, uh, to ride that storm and having enough energy to get through to the other side. And I think that's a good advice, really, on, on really what resilience is, isn't it, Rob? And what you've really described there is how to be resilient. Yeah, and it also helps if you're, uh, if you're following your passion, if you're doing something you really enjoy doing, then you get extra energy boosts from, uh, from uh, following your dream. Yeah. And, and, and uh, a question here about the, the, the court case is coming from somebody who was actually at uh, the Supreme Court um, during the case. And... And, uh, and I don't know if it's a he or a she, but says that I believe that his justice did not serve you well. Um, we were surrounded by all the kiddie knockoffs. It was obvious to all um, that PMS had stolen your design. It was theft on a massive scale. Four years on, what would your message be to the British government about um, protecting intellectual property? Well, we started, a, a, we started a campaign with the government after that to try and shore up um, design registration rights and unregistered design rights. But then Brexit kicked off and then we weren't even sure how our current rights that are European would transcend into the new world outside of Europe. Um, so it kind of, yeah, we've had to take a bit of a back seat and try and fight for um, uh, just getting our current rights to be accepted in, in the new world. Um, what, what advice would you give um, to somebody in dealing with uh, the copy market in China, the cheap copies coming out of China? Well, although we've had this um, big loss of, of what we call the Trunky War, and we've had a huge amount of successes, mainly out in China. There have been over 30 copies of Trunky over the years, and we've, we've won a lot of those. And the front line used to be trade shows, and we had to go up, fly up to all these trade shows get local lawyers involved, walk around, trying to spot copies, trying to try get them removed from their exhibition stands. And then it moved to online and the online trade platforms like Alibaba Groups, Taobao, Taobao Timor, 
uh, a huge amount of marketplaces out there where all these copies pop up and it's a bit like whack-a-mole they pop up you whack them they pop up again so we've outsourced that now to what's called an online brand protection agency that have software uh, and algorithms that spot all the copies and get them knocked down automatically and then they pop up and knock down so um so that's now something i don't have to get too involved in and uh, highly recommend uh, defending that that front line of online retail okay well um just uh, i think uh, one more to 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 finish with and somebody's asked how do, how have you managed to cope with stress and anxiety how have you overcome it and stopped it from being debilitating <clears throat> It is, it is very hard not to, to wallow in the, the challenges and the unjustness of certain things. I remember um, oh, yeah, one of my first um, challenges in business was being taken uh, for age discrimination because some guy didn't get the job. Um, and that really grated on me. And I remember I just bought my first flat and I was painting the walls and I couldn't stop thinking about this. And uh, it was hugely draining. Um, so kind of just getting exercise going out running for me is very therapeutic that helps with the stress um trying to again as i say focus your energies on the problems you can solve rather than the ones you cannot um and being grateful what you for what you've got as well taking a step back being mindful of uh, appreciating what you have gotten achieved and for me that's the the kids um so spending time with them um is great um well i think that, that uh... I think that brings us really to a, 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 a fitting conclusion, really. I, I think it's worth saying that the, the book is now available today on, uh, on Amazon. I think we'll see on the next slide. There's also, uh, I think, 20% uh, off the book at Waterstones if you use a, a promo code TRUNKY. I think I'm right in saying, Rob, the Kindle version's coming out, is it? In Kindle the version is live now as well. So you can get a Kindle version for, uh, I think it's £15 from... Uh, Amazon, uh, we, we really need to uh, drive that sales rank on Amazon. So please buy your book today so we can climb the ranks. And, and I think the biggest reason really to, to, to buy the book, and I'll, I'll just conclude with this observation really, is that, that it is the story, not just of a, a, a successful business and a, and a successful entrepreneur, but it's really a story of a, of a remarkable man. Not, and, I, and I say this really, not just Rob, because of, of what you've achieved, um, but I think of what's come through this morning, which is your humility. And, uh, and what has struck me in, in, in knowing you and working with you is the humility with which you have approached things, the humility with which you receive your success and, and, and deal with your losses. And I think that rubs off on everyone around you. And I think if there's uh, a lesson really for me, for every entrepreneur here, it's, it's, it's whatever obstacle you... Uh, you face, you can overcome. And whatever success you have, always stay humble. And I think your life, Rob, and what you've achieved is, is really a lesson in, in resilience and it's a lesson in, in humility. And, and, and thank you this morning for, for sharing a remarkable story. And, and, uh, and, uh, and please, everyone, buy this book because it's, uh, it is a story unlike any other story of any entrepreneur you will read anywhere. Well, yeah, I hope if you, if you do come with me on this journey with the book, by the book, then you will hopefully, hopefully feel inspired and might be able to make a small change or a big change in your life. And um, that's all I ask. Great. Thank you very much indeed. Rob Law, thank you. Thanks, Peter.